Log entry, the catch, Scarlet Queen, Philip Carney, master. Position, five degrees, five minutes south, 120 degrees, three minutes east. Wind light, sky overcast. Remarks, cleared port of Macassar, Celebes Island, after troubled voyage up coast. Reason for trouble, tattooed beaver and baby food for pare pare. sky nine days out of Sandakan that we swung in toward the mountains that are the backdrop for Macassar, our first port below the equator. The Scarlet Queen threaded her way through the usual clutter of oriental harbor traffic. Rusted inter-island steamers in from Surabaya, Batavia, Amboina, Papua, native craft from Celebes ports. It started to rain when we were halfway across the harbor. By the time we'd reached our berth at the Netherlands Asia Company's docks, our decks were awash with it. And it fell with equatorial consistency for two days. Hang's orders on Macassar had warned that the place was swarming with Constantino men, grouping because of our nearness to the prize Kang had charted me to sail after. The orders were that unless we were contacted the first day, we were to leave and return every 24 hours. The first day passed without contact... So on the second, my chief mate Gallagher and I nosed into the city looking for a short cargo haul or something to make a trip out profitable. We didn't find it. But the third day started out to be better. We got a promise of clearing weather when the barometer started to rise and the chance for a money trip when a visitor walked aboard the Scarlet Queen. I am Van Riper, master of the Loca Juliana. Ah, welcome aboard, Captain. I'm Phil Carney. I see you berthed here. You are for charter? Oh, I might be. Good. I tell you about your passengers. Well, I'm not rigged for passengers. You are good enough. There are only two men and a married couple. Two cabins. They bought passage with me to Pare Pare, but now I don't go. I got a better offer, a cargo for Java. And you already signed for their passage? That is right. They are in a hurry to get there. One day up, one day back. I pay you myself. Two thousand florins. Hmm. Well, all right, Van Riper. Get them aboard. I'll want to leave this afternoon. You have the papers to sign. In this envelope, 2,000 florin. They will be here in two hours. I signed the papers and watched him waddle off and disappear into the driving rain. Gallagher moved his gear into my cabin and we made what preparations we could for the passengers and checked the charts for the run up the Celebes Coast to Pare Pare. It looked like tricky sailing already, but when I read the barometer the last time before my passengers came aboard, I wished I hadn't signed them on. The mercury had risen all morning... But now it was falling rapidly. That and the lessening rain meant only one thing in these latitudes. Storm. And so Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tolman, and starring Elliot Lewis. The Scarlet Queen, proudest ship to plow the seas, bound for uncharted adventure. Every week, a complete entry in the log, and every week, a league further into the strange voyage of the Scarlet Queen. By the time the passengers showed up, even the harbor water was uneasy, stirred by the rolling swells that swept in from Macassar Strait. They came aboard in the following order. First, wearing gaiters, a high clerical collar, flat hat, and a long ecclesiastical rain cape, a hawk-faced man. I am Reverend Beaver, Captain. Harlem Beaver. May I say that your presence in this port was providential? When I think of those poor, gentle savages without a shepherd these many weeks. Yeah, your cabin is the first one to stop it, Reverend. And this uh, companion way here. Number two was a sodden shape encased in white linen that was both wet and dirty. He carried a small black valise. I have been cursed with the name Ambrose Griffith, sir, but you will be relieved to know that there is a qualified physician aboard. Hmm. You bunk with a reverend, Doctor. A reverend, you say? 
<laughs> It'll be a mighty tussle should he grapple with Griffith's demon. First cabin on this side. The couple came aboard with the help of three crewmen. A man in a wheelchair, bundled in scarves, steamer rugs, and rubber sheeting until you could hardly tell what he looked like was carried aboard. Followed by his wife. A pale, worried-looking little woman, at least 15 years younger than her husband, but trying her best to disguise the difference in their ages by the lack of makeup and the shapeless clothes she wore. Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Cram, Captain. My husband is an invalid, as you see. Uh, there are certain things now about our boxes. Oh, you mean your baggage? Uh, no, our supplies. There are 48 boxes in all, and have your men stack them in our cabin. 48? Look, I'm sorry, Mrs. Cram. I contracted to take four passengers. Oh, my dear Captain... I can't take a cargo unless it goes through official channels. Well, if you want to delay your sailing, you are, of course, at liberty to have the supplies inspected. But I assure you, the boxes contain nothing but special foods, strained baby foods, which are necessary to my husband's very existence. Mm. Oh, Captain Carney, if you only knew how hard it's been to attain even this small supply, the delays, the red tape, and my poor Yeah, okay, husband... okay, Mrs. Cram. Gallagher, rig the cargo gear and get it aboard. Forty-eight crates in the cabin? Skip. Well, get what you can in and stow the rest in number one hole. Oh, thank you, Captain. Thank you. Yeah, well, let... Uh-oh. There she comes, Red. Get it aboard and make it secure. Hold her. Lend the chief a hand. Crowder, Gordon, over here. We're rigging storm sails. <laughs> 3 p.m. Ship took on heavy roll on entering Macassar Strait. Sea cresting with heavy cross swell. Sky lowering with scudding clouds. Wind, moderate southeast gale. Velocity 30 knots. Restricted passengers to quarters. Double reefed mainsail and mizzen. Four thirty p.m. Swell rising. Sky unchanged. Wind, fresh southeast gale. Velocity increased to 38 knots. Course altered 10 points to south for reasons of security. Port main backstay carried away. Mainsail taken in. Sailing under jib and mizzen. Eight p.m. Weather conditions unchanged. Ordered ship brought to for night and sails taken in. Keeping bow into storm with motor. Oil lanterns rigged throughout ship due to flooding of generator and failure of electrical power. What's happened to the lights? Generator's been damaged, Reverend. The oil lights will carry us. But your orders were to stay in your cabin until the storm passed over. What are you doing here? I have no need for the protection of the cabin, Captain. But for the sake of my native flock in Pari Pari, I must demand from you our position and the direction in which we are traveling. Our position is just off the Spermondes, and our direction is roughly north by west. Our fate is in your hands, Captain. So saying, I accuse you of the basest untruth. You reversed the direction of the ship and in cowardice. You are retreating toward Mad uh, Macassar. Reverend Beaver, if I could put about to Macassar, I would, but I can't. Our bow is to the storm, and we're losing way before it. Captain Carney, I must reach Pari Pari. Well, we'll make it. When do you expect to resume your course? When it's safe to do it. I hope that will be soon, Captain. So do I. Now, will you please go back to your cabin, Reverend? I got work to do. As you command, Captain. As he left, his hawk-like face was set in an expression that still could have been fear or anger or both. I started for the engine room to see what could be done about the generator. But before I got halfway across the cabin, I was faced by another example of the dwindling passenger discipline in the form of another visitor. This one was at least more pleasant, and he was still carrying his little black bag. I see you've been blessed with a visit from my bunkmate. I and a strange one he is, wandering about the ship the way he does. What about you, Griffity? What are you doing out of your cabin? I've come to share with you a startling bit of information. Oh? What is it? Griffithy has been about some, Captain dear, but for the life of me, never can I remember seeing a hale and hearty man huddled into a wheelchair before tonight. What do you mean? Well, making my rounds among the passengers, bringing them what help I could in the way of soothing words and medicants, I quietly opened the door to the cabin of Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Cram. The gentleman was there alone, Captain, busying himself, pacing the floor fore and aft. Now, what do you think of that? Yeah. Closing the door without giving him a sight of me, I left, returning after a proper time and using my knuckles on the door. Come in, he says, and there he was in his wheelchair. Is there any help I can give you, says I. Get out, says he. Nobody prescribes for me but my personal physician. 
And where might he be, I ask him? Get out, says he, stiffening in anger. So I left him, and there's a story, Captain. Yeah. What do you make of it? Nothing, Doc. It's none of my business. I got trouble enough of my own. Uh, I suppose you're right. Yet it strikes me as queer that a man would waste his time in a wheelchair when he can walk about. But you'll have to admit, Captain dear, it is a strange list of passengers you've got. That it is, Griffity. That it is. I didn't know how strange they were until I made my second try for the engine room. This time I'd gotten to the cabin door before I was stopped. I made it across the bucking cabin as quickly as I could and pulled open the door to the companionway. In the dim light from the oil lamps, I could see two people standing by the cabin shared by Reverend Beaver and Dr. Griffithy. One of them was Vera Cram, and the other, bare to the waist, his upper body covered with intricate tattooing, visible even in the faint light, was the Reverend Harlan Beaver. His right arm was raised before he saw me, and his slap sent Vera Cram reeling across the companionway. <laughs> then he turned and went into his cabin. Oh, Captain, thank heaven you've come. What's going on, Mr. Cram? My husband, Captain. My husband. I'm afraid he's dead. Griffity materialized out of the gloom someplace. They both followed me into the cram cabin. Both portholes were open, and the gale whipping through them had blown out the lamp. I started to light it after closing the ports, but Griffity stopped me. We don't need light, Captain. Poor fellow's dead. And perhaps darkness would be more merciful to the poor widow. Take her out, Captain. I'll do all there is to do, which is little more than covering the deceased from the eyes of the living. All right. Okay, Mrs. Cram, you can come into my cabin. Oh, thank you, Captain. You're very kind. It wasn't until she'd moved into the light that I noticed that a change had come over her. She was no longer without makeup, and she no longer dressed in shapeless clothes. She'd stopped trying to look 15 years older than she was, and she was quite becoming, even in widowhood. Uh, sit down over here, Mrs. Cram. You won't feel a roll so much. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. Captain, I... I feel that I must tell you something. Oh, I've got to talk to someone. Oh, what about? About my husband. I don't believe he died of natural causes. You saw Reverend Beaver in the companion way? When he slugged you, yeah. His clerical robes and his kindly attitudes are a disguise, Captain. I think he killed my husband. Why? Out of jealousy. Harlan Beaver and I were quite closely associated a few years ago. Intimately, you might say. Uh -huh. But he got into serious trouble with the Dutch officials and he was sent to prison. Mm -hmm. I promised to wait for him, but while he was gone, I... Well, I learned to hate him for what he'd done to me. I married Alfred. Harlan found me and wanted me back. He threatened many times to kill Alfred, and I'm convinced that he finally did. Yeah. What's the idea of that clerical disguise, anyway? Just to cover up his tattoo work? I... I'm risking my life in telling you this, Captain... Harlan never finished his prison term. He escaped. Oh, yeah. Captain Carney, could I please stay here under your protection? I'm afraid. Well, if it will make you feel any better, Mrs. Cram, sure. You're welcome to the cabin. By the time the overcast morning had arrived, the wind had dropped to a fresh, gusty breeze... We'd repaired the main backstay, and the Scarlet Queen plunged into the still heavy swells under sail again. We'd made a new course to Pari Pari. We were a half hour out, and I was just being relieved at the wheel when Griffithy walked aft to meet me. Uh, could I have a private word with you, Captain? Sure, Griffithy. How private? Mrs. Cram's in my cabin. Well, in the one recently vacated by her husband. Okay, come on. It's about Cram being killed instead of dying. I already heard it. Oh, did you now? And from whom, may I ask? His wife. Oh, how about it? It's the truth, Captain. He was poisoned. Uh, did she confess? No. She accused Beaver. The Reverend now. <laughs> and what might have been known at him to drive him to such lengths? The fact that he's not a Reverend, he's an escaped convict. Ah. And jealousy over the woman from some past friendship. I know. Splendid. All the elements of drama, Captain Gear. Yeah? Well, you can have it, Griffithy. Sounds a little messy to me. <laughs> you uh, don't approve of these people, Captain? Not especially. None of them turn out to be what they looked like in the first place. The invalid isn't an invalid. He doesn't die, he's killed. The mousy woman turns into a sweater girl. The reverend is an escaped convict. It's a pretty good average. Everybody but Griffithy. He came aboard a villain, and by the saints, a villain he'll remain. 
Uh, what to the gist? Hmm? Uh, feeling a pang of hunger just before Cram departed and having a weakness for strained baby food myself, I went into the hole to get me a can. You got guts, Griffithy, nosing around my ship. Hey, but I'm willing to pay for the liberty I took. Did you know, Captain Deer, that uh, you have a fortune on your ship? Or did I find it out? What are you talking about? Look here. Baby food. The can he held out to me had been opened. The label called it strained vegetables. But the can was filled with salt-like white crystals. It wasn't hard to figure what it was or why Cram had been putting on the invalid act. Narcotics, Captain. A ton of the stuff, I should say. Now listen, Captain dear. You've an eye for profit or you wouldn't be sailing these waters, carrying passengers and the like. The two of us have a fortune stacked up about us here in the cabin and more in the hold. It's ours for the taking. Yeah? Thousands of florins, dollars if you like. Do you have the heart for it? Well, that depends on our chances, Griffithy. Who's to say no? Vera Cram? Yeah, she'll not say a word. Not with the specter of murder hanging over her own head. She'd have a time convincing anybody she didn't poison them for a full share of their supplies. Mm -hmm. Do you think she did? No, because I did. But nobody will prove it, Captain dear, even if they try, which I doubt. You did? A few drops of poison in the oil of the lamp, Captain, after cutting the wires of the generator so we'd have the lamps. Death by absorption of the stuff. A trick developed by the Borgias, God love them, who used the wick of the candle for the same purpose. A handy thing to know, isn't it? Perfect conditions, small cabin, no ventilation with the ports closed against the storm, and Captain Deer, no evidence, the lantern and I chucked over the side. <laughs> what do you think of that? That's very neat, Griffin. <laughs> I liked you better before I heard it, but it's very neat. You will join me in the venture? What's the deal? I simply face her with the truth. Offer her a choice between being turned over for smuggling and murder... And freedom as an honest woman, recently widowed due to natural causes, carrying in her hand a death certificate signed by me and witnessed by you, and dabbing at her eyes from grief brought on by seeing her poor husband buried at sea. What do you think of that? I'll think it over. The thinking's done. What do you mean, man? Well, we've only seen one can of, uh, baby food, Griffithy. You stay here and check some of these. I'm going into the hold and look at some of the ones down there. Okay? <laughs> You gave me a start, man. I thought you'd lost your heart. Yeah. Not me, Griffithy. Captain! Captain! What have you done? After I locked his door, I did the same with those leading to the other principles. If there was anything I didn't want to get mixed up with, it was the Netherlands Indies Customs. They're tough at best and even tougher on non-nationals. I was going to turn over the whole shipload to the first official who'd take them. But I should have thrown them overboard and saved myself the trouble. Our hook hadn't been on the bottom of shallow anchorage off Pari Pari five minutes before the pudgy little local regent had climbed out of his dinghy and stomped into the cabin. The arrival didn't surprise me, but what he had to say did. Captain Carney, I have the pleasure to report that you are to be detained for the arrival of customs officers from the Casa. Well, I thought I'd give you the news, regent. I got them all locked up for you, and the contraband is just as it came aboard. You will receive no leniency for your late show of cooperation. Leniency? Why should I need leniency? Yeah, you ask me that, Captain. Yeah, I ask you that. I didn't know what I had aboard until a little over an hour ago. You waste your time. That true story came from Mikasa last night. What true story? That you loaded the cargo, Captain. It wasn't cargo, and I didn't know what it was. The passengers were transferred from another ship. Papers, baggage, yeah, supplies, yeah, yeah, and all. Yeah, 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 you tell me that. But I tell you, Captain Van Riper went to the customs... Captain Van Riper? Yeah. What does he know about it? He says the cargo was not on his ship. That he saw you and the cram woman talking and that you took money from her. Ah. Well, then it's a frame. A what? I don't know what you call it out here. It means Van Riper's lying. Why should he lie? To get me into trouble with customs. Hey. What company does he sail under, do you know? Yeah, it says on the message. Uh, it is here. Um, do you read that? I don't have to. Constantino, isn't it? That is the name. Yeah, I thought so. Gallagher! 
Stay right down, Skipper. Never mind coming down. Up anchor. We're sailing out of here. Great. What do you mean it, Skipper? Get moving, Red. Get us out of here. Stand by the up anchor. Hey, Nielsen, what's the sketch? Yeah, Skipper. I know, Fatty. You're a big man around here, but I can't stand still for this one. Now, do you want a pleasant trip, or do I have to brain you? And don't think I'm not mad enough to do it. Don't try it. You resist the Netherlands Indies government? When it reaches for a gun, I guess we'll have to. <laughs> Now, I warned you, Fatty. I'll warn you again. You'll be a good boy or I'll lash you to a mast. You hear from... The... I've heard enough already. Now, come on. Get up on your feet and follow me around. Don't talk. Just listen. You know, if you behave, you'll make yourself a name on this island. Come on. <laughs> Griffin, are you there? Hey, what's brewing? We're heading out to sea again. I got good news for you, Griffin. Yeah, I got a Dutch official who wants to come in with us. Uh? Protection. <laughs> you don't say now. Aye, what a fortune will do to the official mind. Here he is. Yeah. Yeah. He's worried about one thing. He thinks too many people know the stuff's aboard. Oh. He doesn't quite believe that you and the woman and I are the only ones, and that even I didn't know until an hour or so ago. Ah, that's right. There's not a thing to fear, man, dear. It was a good scheme from the beginning, and it's proven now. Yeah, since you killed Cram. Well, uh, that is a subject without appeal when I'm faced with a uniform. Thanks, Griffithy. We'll get together later and map our course. <laughs> After locking Griffithy in his cabin again, I left the regent in Gallagher's hands and called on Vera Cram. All I had was passion and greed to work with, but sometimes when they're stirred together, they're strong medicine. To her, I told the whole story up to, but not including, the meeting with Dutch law or its presence aboard. Then I went to the Reverend Harlan Beaver and told him the same, using only the truth, except in regard to one point. Because when I left him, he believed that Vera was not only denying him a share of the fortune in drugs as well as herself, but that she decided to share them both with Griffithy. I led the regent into my cabin, tucked him in a corner out of sight but within hearing, and returned his gun to him. I stationed Red outside the passageway in case I needed him, and then I gathered the passengers. What is the meaning of this meeting, Captain? I contracted for passage to my mission in... You can drop the act and take off the high-collar beaver. We all know who you are. Vera. I had to tell him, Holland, darling. I thought he'd help us. Help us what? Spend a fortune from your narcotics? Uh, Captain, I don't... Shut up, Grimity! I thought he'd help us with your escape, Holland, so that we could start our life together again, Holland. But, Captain, why has the situation... Stay quiet, Grimity! Please, Holland. Well, now, who might you be to be quiet in me? What? Vera. I've taken the last from you. The months in prison I did for you. The escape I did for you. The hiding in disguise I did for you. Even your marriage didn't stop me. But this has. What, Harlan? I don't understand. Don't lie to me. I'd only felt this way before. How easy it would have been. But I don't understand. After Cram is dead, and you decide to share what you are and what you have with Griffithy, you don't understand that anything I felt for you has turned to hate. Griffithy. What have you been saying, Griffithy? I haven't been saying anything. No, of course you haven't. Why should you? Because I don't talk unless I think, Beaver, which is more than I can say for the two of you. But now I have thought, and I know why the captain has brought us here. <laughs> don't say the gun, Griffithy! It is the captain who thinks he will gain, but he won't. Alan, no! The medicine almost backfired. Griffithy pulled a revolver out of his pocket, pushing his chair back as he stood. He swung toward me, but Beaver's hate and jealousy were faster. <laughs> His gun spoke before he realized that Griffithy was drawing on me. He watched Griffithy's body slump to the floor, and while he did, the truth came to him. He looked up at me, started to raise his gun again. Then my Dutch ally in the corner opened up. <laughs> Beaver's right shoulder jerked twice under the shocks. He spun slowly around and collapsed loosely onto the deck. He is not dead, no? No, I don't think so, but thanks anyway. Hey, Skipper, it work all right? Yeah, yeah, Red. You know, I think I set a record of some kind. I've been saved twice in as many minutes. Once by an escaped convict and once by the law. Not bad, Skipper, not bad. Yeah, they will read about me in the newspapers in MacArthur. Better than that, Fatty. You're going to make a personal appearance. Because that's where we're going now. By nine the following morning, we'd made the return trip to Macassar, left our cargo, including passengers dead and alive, and the fat hands of the regent, 
received our sailing orders and headed out once more into a brightening sky over the strait. We left the harbor under power, but when we threaded through the traffic and found deep, clear water, we settled back on the wind. Stand by to make sail! The water was brushed into white caps by the playful gusts that were all that remained of the storm. The starboard sheep make sail! The mainsail drew up to its height. The boom swung heavenly out. The deck beneath me shuddered a little under the first rush of sail power. Is your chief, man? Smartly now! The jibs went up and tightened. Then the mizzen. And the Scarlet Queen dug in. And the spray at her bow turned creamy with her speed. Lifted into the air. Blew to starboard like spindrift. A better departure than the last one, Skipper. Yeah, somewhat, mate. Now, we ought to set up a rule. No more passengers. They just mess up the ship. Well, they aren't all bad, Red. Oh, I don't know. Some of my best friends have been passengers. Well, how about smugglers? Well, all right. I'll go along with you there. We accept no more smugglers. Yeah, well, it's a relief to hear that. I know I'll sleep easier. You sound like you don't believe me, Red. Sure, I believe you, but I just don't trust smugglers. Well, that's a good, honest American remark, Red. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, too. Drink, Skipper? Yeah, if you're sure it isn't contraband. After you, mate. After you. Log entry, the Catch Scarlet Queen. 5.30 p.m. Miles traveled from San Francisco, 16,821. Sky overcast, wind light, carrying full sail. Ship secure for night. Signed, Philip Carney, Master. Voyage of the Scarlet Queen has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio 